So um, just a brief introduction for me. For those of you who don't know, my name is Josh. Uh, I've been around the Drupal community for a long time. And uh, I'm Outlandish Josh on Twitter and other places on the internet. And I work for Pantheon, a website management platform that wants to make it fast to build, fast to launch, and fast to run websites. So I have a long background of being interested in website performance, particularly from the infrastructure platform, the server side, the back end, if you will. And I'm here to talk about the other side of the equation, which I think is, you know, this is why I'm giving the talk, because I think it's a very important side of the equation. We all need to get with it a little bit more. So. Sorry, I only came for the dance. <laughs> Damn. Uh, I guess that's what happens. So uh, this is a real talk presentation, which means it's, uh, I'm going to try to make it a no bullshit presentation. And I uh, have prefaced some of my recent performance, talk, performance talks with this uh, label because everyone cares about performance, but it's often like a, a misunderstood thing. And I feel like uh, on the web, there's kind of like this self-referential victim cycle we get into where the worst aspects of the web lend themselves to the worst aspects of talking about the web. So like you'll sometimes read blog posts or you'll even see a presentation and it's kind of like this one weird trick that they use to get their website fast. Um, or this website, this guy's uh, site is totally jacked. The Rackspace hates him. Um, and uh, that's not how it works in real life. Like this is actually a discipline. Um, it is a lot of small improvements that add up to the big results that we all need. It's something that requires constant attention and iterative focus. Um, but it's something that's actually very important. And uh, my, my biggest hope in giving this talk is, is actually twofold. One, that some of you in the audience who are currently a little bit more like my background, like kind of traditional Drupal performance backend sort of people um, wake up and like want to start to play on the other side of the fence, because I think we actually need that. And my other hope is that some of you are here who are just generally interested in performance, but currently feel like it's some kind of magical, like you have to have a level 10 wizard hat to do it like get inspired because you don't need a level 10 wizard hat. All you need is like a brain that can do logical processing and a will to do it. And it's a great field to get into. It's a vital field. It will ensure you career safety for the next decade or more. So uh, hopefully I, I can be an inspiration. Um, so I want to start with real talk. Time is important. We're all here for a finite amount of time. And how we spend that time is the value of our lives. And uh, it's important to remember and recognize that. Can I ask for a show of hands, how many of you develop websites professionally in the audience who do this for a living? OK, so that's probably a little over 100 hands raised. And at like the lower end estimate of going market rates, that means this session costs over $10,000. Right, the opportunity cost of all of you listening to me is somewhere north of 10 grand. So hopefully, I will make it worth your time. But it's all about this. Time is important. And all of the, the, the things that have been going on on the web, like we've been trending in the wrong direction for, a long, for a, quite a while now. Um, there's a, uh, I don't know if any of you saw Ian's uh, presentation on what they've been through at Vox. Um, but they had a great famous blog post where they basically said, we have to declare performance bankruptcy. Um, and if you look across the web at some of the loading times for major properties um, and, and you know, websites that get a lot of traffic, like, the trends are not good. Um, and some of this has to do with the way we build our websites. Some of it has to do with the market around how advertising is often delivered. But overall, like, the web is not getting like, faster. The internet speeds are getting faster, but the web itself is, in many cases, getting slower. And that's bad. That's a problem. Um, and we all think, eh, it's not that bad because we are always on fast Wi-Fi and you know, we have the latest devices and everything else. But if we want the world wide web to fulfill its promise in being worldwide, we have to care about performance. And we have to care about performance at the last mile. And that means front end performance. Um, you might think, oh, I don't need to worry about this. I'm on Pantheon or some other awesome infrastructure provider. I've got lighting up the Pantheon signal. It's going to make my website fast. Um, and I wish. Of course, like, I'd like to in, like, infer that for sales and marketing purposes. But since I'm giving a presentation, I have to tell you that all of these technologies that we deliver, real talk, all of these badass pieces of the stack that we put in place and deliver for you to try to make your website uh, fast, they don't matter. Ultimately, these are not the things that make your website performant. Um, they're important parts of the puzzle. So they don't matter. None of these things matter if you give someone a web experience that involves this. Right? So um, I've been called in countless times to look and debug something and try to figure out why the site is slow. And you know, usually if I'm looking at it from the back end, it's like a slow query or something like that. And then I look at the website itself, because I'm also just curious, and I'll look at the page source. And I'm like, oh, 
I saw the best stacks of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, unable to aggregate their CSS files. Um, and this is just, I pulled the source from my personal blog uh, just for the effect, but like oftentimes in production, I ask people, well, um, there's a slow query and we can help you with that, but like, why don't you have CSS aggregation turned on? And they'll say, oh, it's because one of the pages didn't look right. Um, and I mean, that's a trade-off that, that I think uh, at some point someone is making, but the developer who allowed that trade-off to be made failed. That's like a major, like we are letting ourselves and Drupal and the internet down when we allow that kind of trade-off to be made. Saying, well, this page doesn't look right, so let's just make it load three seconds slower. Um, let's just like destroy the user experience so that the end result is fine. Um, and I think it's like we have, we're, we're, we've made great progress of like advancing our industry and craft away from like, here's a Photoshop doc, make the web look like it. But we're, we're still not there if we can't explain that, no, we actually need to spend the time and energy to make sure that this web page both looks right and also loads in an acceptable amount of time. Um, your server response time, while fundamental to, to delivering a performance web experience, doesn't matter if your user experience is like this. I'm going to pick on these guys a little bit. It's pretty weak. Um, you know, it's complete page load in 7.5 seconds, but it was really almost five seconds before I could even read the headline. Um, and this is a website that spends, that makes all of its money from being a website, um, spends a lot on infrastructure, is actually on some of the best infrastructure you can get and their user experience is still poor. Um, and it's because this is hard, right? Performance is moving up the stack. The expertise that we have all developed in the Drupal community, you know, that started way back in the day with, oh, like, okay, what kind of disks do you want to have and how much RAM do you need to, like, make sure that your Drupal site can scale and is performant? Um, or, like, how do we tune PHP and Apache and, like, where does Varnish fit in and, like, what's the right, what's the right buffer pool setting for my SQL? All those things are, there's, that took a lot of energy and effort to figure all that stuff out, but those are mostly solved problems now. Um, and even if you solve those problems, it doesn't mean you have a fast website because the operative area for developer intelligence to be applied to deliver great user experience is moving up. So we need to be really thinking more about our Drupal architecture. Drupal 8 does some amazing things for this that I'll get into later, but like really being cognizant of our Drupal architecture and what that does, both for initial response time and for render time. The content architecture. This is where, for those of you who do consulting work, like it's very difficult to deliver great user experiences if you're not engaged in a kind of a strategic level discussion with your stakeholders and your clients. Because if you don't talk about what their objectives are with the content, it's very hard to optimize the user experience in a way that's going to blow everyone's minds. And ultimately, your customers and stakeholders want to blow everyone's minds because that's how your message gets out. Like, fast websites matter not just because they frustrate users and people navigate away. Fast, fast websites matter because you get better search results when your website is faster. You will get people to not just not leave your website, but a fast website will keep people on it longer, reading more of the content, getting more of the messages, converting at a higher rate. Those are the real reasons people have websites, because they're trying to get something done. And if the website is not performant, the chance that they'll be able to get what they want done in the world decreases. Um, and then ultimately, of course, like it actually is a highly technical challenge of optimizing the DOM, the document object, blah, blah, the d document object model, um, and how the browser parses it and renders it so that we can give a, you know, a, a snappy user experience and make sure that everything is fast all the time. So this is my basic pitch, is that all of us who care about performance need to start caring about performance closer and closer to the user, because that's where the real action is, that's where the market is moving quickly, that's where the fun stuff is, to be honest, and it's also the most important, because if we don't do the last mile, it doesn't matter what we did on the back end. Oh, yeah, fast websites matter, I just explained that. So um, how fast? That's actually a really interesting question. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what kinds of thresholds in speed you should be concerned with and targeting. Um, and this is based on research that actually goes back to the early 90s, which is really about application performance in, on like PCs. This has been backed up more recently by a lot of uh, research that Google has done. Our page ranking overlords clearly care about this, and they're trying to make us care about it again with the SEO kind of tipping the scales. But they have good usability studies on this and good like front end performance resources. Really, all the research converges on this idea that there are kind of three thresholds. 
There's a 10 millisecond threshold, and because it's done by engineers and scientists, they just like pick the, the round number order of magnitude. I'll bet you that like maybe there's like a 10.2 or 1.1. But just think of it as 10 milliseconds, a tenth of a second, one second, or a thousand milliseconds, and 10 seconds. These are the three basic thresholds that you have in considering whether what kind of user experience you're able to deliver to um, to the person at the other end of the wire. So the 10 millis the 100 millisecond um, experience is awesome. Right, this is real time. Like, uh, uh, if you're doing like a first-person shooter or something, you want a frame rate that's higher than this because, like, you're or VR or something. But for our purposes, a hundred milliseconds between a user doing something and having an interaction makes it feel like they are directly interacting with the product, directly interacting with the system, and receiving real-time response. It's fast enough that the brain just perceives it as being conversational, and that is a really high bar to hit. It's a very difficult bar to deliver for user experience, but thinking about how you can get something, even if it's not the complete thing going in this kind of time is like kind of the, that's like the gold standard. Like if we can make our interactions with users feel like they happen at this speed, we will have delivered the best possible web experience. In reality, oftentimes, you know, networking is involved in other stuff. So like there's this one second uh, time threshold. One second is pretty good, right? One second has been um, shown in studies to not break the train of thought of a user. So the user will notice that there is a pause and they will wait for it. They're, they're happy to wait for it. There's no, they, they don't register any frustration. More importantly, they don't start thinking about anything else. So if you want to think about like your website as delivering a kind of a fl cognitive flow with the person in front of the browser, the one second threshold or thereabouts is what you get to and you just keep them on task. Uh, and this is kind of like the magic, this is the magic tipping point for how fast your basic web page loads. Because when you are a user and you click a link or something like that, it's because you're interested in seeing or reading something. And if that seeing or reading can happen in about a second, you won't, there's no boredom, there's, there's no, not, not even beyond like frustration. There's just, you're still on task. The user is still focused on whatever they were doing before. And so for whatever you're trying to achieve in the world, this is a, 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 still a very difficult bar to reach, but it is a bar that I think we can all legitimately aspire to. And then finally, there's the 10 second use case. 10 seconds, let's just watch this. Uh. Ah, that's excruciating, right? And what, what, we have, what the research shows is that 10 seconds is basically as far as you can go before people will just say, fuck this, I'm out of here. Um, or, or at a minimum, they'll open another tab and start looking at something else. Um, or they'll, they'll put their phone down and do something. Like, this is the point at which you've lost them. Um, and like, you know, there's the, it's not that like 10 seconds is the number, but it's where like in the research studies, like it's kind of a tipping point. It's all downhill from here. If you're taking 10 seconds or more, it's over, right? You're not going to get, you're not going to be delighting your users. You're not going to be um, uh, engaging with them. You're going to be losing them to the competition. Um, and I'm going to pick on these guys some more. So here's a simulated mobile browser load of that same big web blog at 3G speed. And there's the click. Oh, like that's really bad. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's like there's a reason why the publishing business is in, is in turmoil because too often this is what's happening. Uh, other usability research has shown that delays like this where people are on a mobile device waiting for content cause on average a 38% increase in heart rate which is comparable to watching a horror movie. Um, and more importantly for a business stakeholder, this is significantly more stress than people experience waiting in line at a brick and mortar store. So again, if you're talking to a business stakeholder and you're trying to convince them that they should care about performance too, there is a wealth of research out there that you can tap into. And if they have half a brain, you should be able to make the case that this is far more important. Um, if this is the experience you're delivering, focus on nothing else 
until you fix this. Because it doesn't matter how good your content is, it doesn't matter how many articles you can cram into that listicle, if it takes 27 seconds, which is about what this is, for someone to click the link, 3G is like what most of the mobile world browses on from time to time. Like even if you have better than 3G service, if you're bouncing between towers uh, uh, on a mobile network, you can have packet loss, which will require reconnection in the middle. It can actually end up being slower than this. So you really, like we need to consider very carefully what we're putting users through when their, la when their internet last mile isn't optimal, uh, which is most people in a lot of the time uh, trying to load our content. Um, so real talk, if this was easy, I would not be here giving them to talk to you. It wouldn't be worth $10,000 of the community's time. So um, uh, I don't have any simple answers. Um, there is not one weird trick. Um, your website can get totally jacked, but it, it, you know, the only way you get there is by like, you know, going and lifting a lot. So, uh, or the, me the metaphorical equivalent of doing that. Um, so in particular, uh, HTTP2 is awesome, but it is not pixie dust. You can't simply sprinkle it across your web properties and absolve yourself of all these sins. Um, Big Pipe, which I will talk about, is amazing, and what it's built upon in Drupal, I think, is in Drupal 8 is going to change our lives and change what we can deliver to the world in terms of user experience. But it's not magic, right? It's not like you just connect the Big Pipe to it and suddenly all of this goes away. You have to understand what's going on. You have to consider how it's going to help you. You have to test and verify that you are getting the results you want from a user experience, and then you will be in, like this wizardy Munich guy in there. Um, and, uh, and at a more basic level, you can't just like throw varnish on something and say like, yep, that's as good as it gets. We are doing everything we can. Like, I have built this great platform at Pantheon and it's not enough. Like, it is not going to get the job done without an army of developers out here that really care about this stuff. Um, real talk, you can't beat the speed of light. Um, let's just talk about how the internet works for a second. Um, light traveling through a fiber cable doesn't travel as fast as light moving through a vacuum. It travels at about 66%, two thirds of the speed of light is the best you're gonna get over, uh, over an unbroken fiber cable. The distance between San Francisco and New York is about 4,000 4, kilometers. That would be 42 milliseconds of round trip at the available speed of light in a fiber optic cable, and an actual ping is 80, 81 milliseconds. So the internet at, at distance is already like halfway to the physical limit of how fast it could ever possibly be. Um, which is awesome, by the way. Go internet. Um, half the speed of light. That's pretty, pretty incredible. But the, the point is that this is, a, this is a something we, we are all going to have to confront and deal with. We can't, like, faster internet speeds will not fix the front end experience, right? That is just, we can't expect that. Like, more bandwidth isn't going to solve the problem. Like, it can be a component of solving the problem, especially on, like, a throttled mobile environment, but more bandwidth doesn't fix it. Um, you know, that available bandwidth in the last mile question, I mean, there's lots of cases where the, the average user experience is much more likely to be on. Like, I haven't been using, I'm not using it now because I'm using tethered, tethered to my phone, but how's the conference Wi-Fi in general? Like, mm, yeah, I, yeah, they, they, they warn them every time. And then they're like, no, 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 it'll be fine. We have conferences here all the time with people and, and computers. And then, and then they're like, oh, <laughs> y'all really like the internet, huh? <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Um, but that is, this is much closer to the everyday internet user's experience. Like, it's the Wi-Fi router that your nephew set up three years ago that you know to unplug and plug back in sometimes when it stops working completely, but it's not optimal. Or it's, it's the, your office IT situation is like pretty old school. Like, they're more focused on the copiers and printers and, and uh, uh, power cabling and other stuff. And like, the network just is what it is. Like, you're still on a T1 line. That used to be super freaking fast. It's super freaking slow now, relatively speaking. Um, or you're on one of these mobile devices, right? You're, you're like the modern American family, which is doing more and more and more and more and more time on mobile. And it's not coming at the expense of time on desktops and laptops. It's actually mostly coming at the expense of watching TV and other things like that. But the, the wireless network in the house with this many devices, if they don't have a good router, it's not set up well, there's going to be some lag, there's going to be some packet loss maybe. The, the mobile networks, like you could be, um, if you're moving through, through space and time, right? You're driving down the freeway or you're on a train or something, you're going to face, like it's not going to be an optimal last mile experience. So at, at scale, at distance, the internet already going half the speed of light as, light as fast as it can possibly be, and the last mile network is going to be slower than that, inevitably. Even under ideal circumstances, it'll be slower than that. But in most cases, it'll be much worse than that. So the network is not something that's going to help us, and we need to think about how we deliver good user experiences anyway. 
Um, meantime, the average web page is now the size of Doom. Um, statistics that have been tracked by this uh, researcher um, and front end performance guy, Ronan Kremen from Ireland, um, just creeping up and up and up over time. And what used to be like a $50 piece of software that would come in a box is now the average web, pa web page that you load. The average web page, this is not Drupal, this is across the internet. The average web page has 30 or more images, 15 or more scripts, four style sheets, four point something style sheets. Um, and if those things aren't put together in a way that makes sense and is optimized, the end user experience is not great. And I think we've been you know, trending away from this. So like, don't just like build the average website. Um, we want to build a better than average website. And again, um, Ronan Kremen and his boys have a, a lot of good humor about this. Um, it's important to have in such dark times. We need to make the internet great again. <laughs> um, so real talk, the 1%, uh, I'll be using the phrase loosely, the 1% of the web knows that this matters. Right, the 1% of the web are smart enough to declare a performance bankruptcy. They've used the chapter laws to help the business. Um, uh, and you can see it. It's in the data. Right? The, web, the average web is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And around 2014, the top sites on the internet started to bend away from that. Um, because they are aware that they can't just keep bloating up the user experience and retain their position as the top sites on the internet. The top sites on the internet will be the fastest sites on the internet, almost inevitably and without exception. But we are the 99%. Um, uh, not, not necessarily, again, figuratively, not literally. But without tools like Drupal to build fast websites, and without developers of websites with Drupal that know about and care about performance, like the average website will continue to suffer. And so it, it is incumbent upon all of us to do something about this. The internet is what we make of it. And we can and will make it faster. So. Um, that's the end of my doom and gloom portion of the presentation. And now we'll get into some like, stuff that you can actually do to fix things and uh, just some practical advice. I will actually include a listicle at the end. Um, if you want, you can print it out and send it to your boss. OK, so I like to think of front-end performance as a hierarchy of needs. The hierarchy of needs is just a neat little mental model that I like to imagine what it takes to do stuff. And this is kind of modeled off the, the Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. So the high-performance origin is a base uh, a base level of need for a front end, good front end performance. Like uh, what, um, what uh, uh, Vim and Fabian were talking about with performance versus perceived performance. Um, oftentimes in Drupal when we say performance, we really just mean how fast did the server respond. That is an incomplete conception of performance. And I would put forth that perceived performance is the only performance that any of us should care about. Because what we are delivering is ultimately a user experience. And if the, again, no matter how fast the server responds, if the user doesn't see it, then it didn't really matter. However, if the server is slow, you're screwed, right? What are you supposed to do about that? If, you're, if Drupal can't respond in like for three or four seconds, you're just never going to have a great user experience. So you need a high performance origin. I think you also need the ability to test and iterate. Um, this is something where uh, there, are, there are tools to use around this, but I find oftentimes like uh, local development can be uh, a little bit of a siren song here because local development is awesome because it's fast. It's fast because you've eliminated the network from the equation. And because you've eliminated the network from the equation, you may have blinded yourself to a large set of problems. Um, and there are, there are ways to get around this, but you need to think about how you are testing, how you are iterating. Because if you can't iterate, you can't improve. You need to be able to like, make changes, measure them, release them, make changes, measure them, release them. That's how we get progress. It's not one weird trick. It's a lot of little things that add up to a big deal. Um, so once you have a high performance origin and you're able to test and iterate, then you can start going about optimizing your DOM and your assets. You can ascribe to like sub-second paint. That's like the one second. Get something in front of the user in a second or less. And that's like pretty much like where everybody needs to be, I think, from a professional standpoint. And then we can all aspire to the, the, the gold standard of 100 millisecond interaction. Um, so the DOM is your dominion. Um, this is something that uh, I think in the Drupal world, a lot of us kind of throw up our hands and say like, ah, divitis, what am I going to do? Um, uh, and I think that we just can't, that's not going to cut it anymore in this world. Um, especially with Drupal 8 coming out, there's more and more power and control being given to front end developers. And we need to get behind that, encourage it, and make the most of it. Because ultimately, we are responsible for what gets sent down the wire to the browser. That is our business. That is our responsibility. And we should take it seriously and not just kind of be like, oh, whatever, it's Drupal did that to me. No, you let Drupal do that. Um, so we have to think about it. And we need to think about like some of the times there's low-hanging fruit. Like 
people don't optimize their images. And I'm not saying that image optimization is it's not one weird trick to fix your performance, but if you haven't thought of this and looked at it, it's a really easy thing to look at and possibly do. Here's two red squares. One of them is 11K, the other is one. Which red square is better? They're fine, they're equivalent. Here's some parrots. Um, that's, those parents could, could be 263 kilobytes, or they could be 93 kilobytes. Or actually, they could be 30 kilobytes if you wanted to get crazy. Can you tell the difference between these parrots? I mean, there's a little bit of image artifact on the last one, but maybe that's okay. Understanding the needs and the requirements of your content, um, not just for image optimization, but in general, is an important part of being able to do front-end performance optimization. Because once you understand the needs and requirements of your content, you know the parameters that you can work with in terms of what you can optimize and, and what what you have to deliver in a you know, less than optimal way because there's another good reason. Um, and far too often it's just like, uh, you know, we don't have, it's too much work to do that, content editors, user generated content, everything else. And like, no, you can do this. You can set up image cache and the media module to do a certain amount of compression and you can look at how much can be done there and you can try to get better at that and you can try to decrease the footprint and decrease the weight of your web pages. Um, even if you're developing locally, um, for those of you who don't know, all the major uh, developer tools support this idea of having a simulated mobile experience on your, your desktop. So in Chrome, which is my jam, but Firefox, Safari, even Edge, um, you can click this little button, you can disable all your caches, and you can throttle your network. Um, and if you're not actually looking at your, you should be looking at your web pages under these circumstances, just to know. Um, this doesn't substitute for like actual real world mobile testing because you want to actually look at it on the device. You can like feel the form factor and, and like it's not emulating the browser perfectly here, but it is giving you like a kind of a gut check on what your mobile experience is going to be like. So I would say like on your next project, early in the process, don't leave this to the very end to check right before you launch and like have a sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach because you realize you either have to launch something that's slow or push back the deadline. Early in the process, Start building this into your normal project flow to check in on and say like, hey, how's our front end performance looking? You know, I, I throttled it down to 3G and it was actually, it wasn't so good. Is that okay? Do we, do we want to invest in fixing that? Do we want to invest now in fixing that or do we want to get to that later? Um, what would it take to fix that? Why is it slow, so slow on 3G? That's an interesting question. Let's understand what's happening there. Let's understand what the requests that are, are bottlenecking and so forth. Why does it take so long to load? If you can understand a problem, then you can fix it. You can iterate, you can measure, you can deliver better results. Um, the waterfall in, in Chrome is another great one. So this is just shows you all the assets that are being loaded and you know, sort of take it one step beyond the page speed or the Y slow that just gives you a letter grade and tells you to like, I mean, those are good things to do too. But this is like, you know, dig into it. Understand, what am I telling the browser to do? How is it responding to the web page that I deliver? What is actually going on down there on the user's desktop or laptop or mobile phone? Let's grok that so that we can make it better for them. Um, and in particular, you need to know the time it takes to fetch the assets to build your page. And this is, um, this is a good one here where um, this asset took like 0.342 seconds, 3.43 seconds to load, but 300 of those milliseconds, sorry, milliseconds, not seconds, 300 of those milliseconds were queuing, which basically means that the browser knew that it had to fetch it, but it was waiting to do so because it was already fetching a bunch of other things. Um, and uh, this is the, one of the most common uh, uh, downfalls of front-end performance is just that there's too much to gather before the page can render. So if you, uh, you know, all browsers have concurrency limits. Uh, mobile browsers typically have lower concurrency limits than desktop browsers. Uh, people try to get around this by like domain sharding and they have www2 and www3. That really only gets you so far because the browser itself won't run more than, depending on the browser, four or six or eight concurrent requests. And so if you have a web page that has like 60 assets on it that need to load before the, the thing can paint, it's just gonna queue those things and request them in the, as fast as it can. It's doing the best job that it can, but you've given it an impossible task. Even if all those responses come in super, super quickly, you can't beat the speed of light, there's still a round trip involved, and they're just gonna be waiting in line before the web page renders and your users will be sad. So understanding what your request times are, why they are what they are, and then what can you do about that, that is really the key to understanding front-end performance. And like, which ones of them block rendering and which ones of them don't. That's really our business. It is our business to understand that and make it better. Um, so the state of the art is we should be able to do this progressively, right? We should be able to think in terms of like understanding our content well enough that when you load a page, it's be like, boom, 
Now, the great, this is a great example, right? That first experience, it's, like, it's not 100 milliseconds, but it's well under a second. Like, you, I, the page got loaded, and there it was. Like, I saw that the web page was going to be there. Like, all, already I'm feeling confident about this web page loading, and even though the lorem ipsum isn't even, isn't even in place. Like, it gives me, as a user, a feeling like, oh, OK, cool, this is working. I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to watch it. And then the lorem ipsum comes in. I'm like, great, the lorem ipsum is here. That was the main thing I was interested in reading. And then that sidebar thing popped in later, and I'm cool with that, because like, I started reading the main thing, and maybe the sidebar Bar, you know, wasn't so important for me, or it was something that was, uh, I'm going to look at secondarily. So this is only possible if we understand what our websites are trying to achieve, how their content is structured, and then and only then can we make decisions about whether or not certain things can wait or certain things can be laid, loaded uh, sooner. Um, so this again. You can't achieve this if we're just like at the very end of the line as developers siloed away from the conversation about what the mission of the website is or how its content is structured. We have to be participants in that conversation to do our work here. And we should, you know, get into the and like we'll have good input. Like people should have us in the room for that. It's really worthwhile. Um, you can't beat the speed of light, but you can use a CDN. Um, I think anybody who's concerned with their user experience and front-end performance, unless all of your users are in the same town as you and so is your server, you should be using a CDN. Like there are CDN services out there that are really cheap, they're really, they're, or to, they're even free, they're easy to set up, they're easy to configure, and they confer many, many tangible benefits to your users, to the users of your website. Um, which is basically like for the, you know, it's obvious, right? If there's a point of presence that's closer to the user, there's less time that the data is spent as photons in a fiber optic cable, and then the user gets to see the thing faster. And like, you can try to get your web page, you know, really lean down and like, but there's going to be limits to how far you can shave down what the requests that are in the web page. Making those web page requests turn around faster is key to delivering a good front end experience, right? You need varnish on your origin for your, uh, for your anonymous user but you also can push all of the assets out to the edge much closer to them and that's how you'll be able to get the, you know, that's how you can get below a one second render for most use cases. Pretty hard to do that without a CDN unless the place you're measuring from happens to be close to your, uh, your data center. HTTP2, electric boogaloo, um, is coming, it's here. This is actually pretty awesome. This is, this is stuff to get excited about. Um, it is not magic pixie dust, it doesn't absolve us of all of our sins, but it does materially change the equation of front end performance. And it's uh, the first major revision in a long time to the HTTP protocol. Um, it's been hammered out you know, uh, uh, over years uh, through the, the uh, IFTT, or uh, RFC process. And um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this um, and not a lot of really great, easily understandable information about what it, why it matters. So I'm not going to talk about how it's a binary protocol, and uh, and I could do a whole session on what it takes to get a good HTTP2 debugging setup set up on your laptop. I'll, maybe I'll do a blog post about that later. But just to talk about why we should all care about this and how this matters. Um, okay. So as we were talking about before, uh, in the HTTP1 world, you have client and server, and you have lots of requests back and forth. Right, the original request for the HTML, that gets delivered, it gets parsed, there's things in there like CSS, JavaScript, images, and other items. Those are then become new requests. Every one of those requests is a TCP um, handshake, which is actually a whole back and forth ahead of time to do the same in the ACK. Um, if you're doing HTTPS, which everybody should be doing, there's that negotiation that goes on. And then there's sending the bits over the wire um, to actually get them back down to, to the client. And uh, there's concurrency limits on how many of those things can happen at once, and you're paying the performance. Of, oh, there's also a DNS lookup, potentially. So you're paying some overhead for every one of those requests, and that's a major challenge for front-end performance. And everybody knows this. Like, the HTTP protocol, originally, the way it was set up was like, you know, it's from the 90s, um, and it was when the web pages, they were all super responsive because it was just HTML, and you, know, you could drag it back and forth, and there wasn't that much else going on. It was assumed that it would be one transaction per web page. And as it turns out, that's not how the web has evolved. So HTTP2 institutes uh, request pipelining, which basically says we will open one connection between the browser, the client, and the server, the user agent and the, and the origin. And then we will use that one connection to do much business. And that is uh, beneficial because it avoids the reconnection overhead and allows you to push concurrency way up because you're no longer tying up uh, a socket for each request. Um, it also, HTTP2 introduces, uh, oh, I'll get to that in a second. So um, how this ends up playing out in practice is, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but I'll explain it to you. 
This is a, a, a wonderful web page that a gentleman set up which uh, is just designed to demonstrate the benefits of HTTP2. So the web page itself is just every flag in the world um, on, on a web page so, and, and as an individual image. So it's like something like you know, 200 plus images. And on the left, you have that under HTTP 1.1. And you can see the waterfall is just sort of pushing out and pushing out and pushing out as this queuing is occurring. Even though each individual image is small and it's not doing anything, like it's not like a Drupal request, it's just loading an image from the, the, the web server. So it's turning it around pretty fast. But because of the queuing and everything else, it just pushes it out and out and out and out and out. And it takes a while to load the whole page. On the right, it's under HTTP2. You can see that all of, a lot of those requests start at the same time and finish at the same time. And at the end, it ends up being about 40% faster, um, which is great. Like, that is exactly what we want to get from HTTP2. Like, that is going to be a huge benefit to all of us. And what it will mean in practice is many of the tactics that we currently use um, to improve front end performance, like CSS aggregation or spriting um, for your assets, will become less necessary. They may not become unnecessary um, because there will be. Uh, there are still some benefits in terms of how you can compress things, and there are still limits to concurrency. So, you know, if you, you it's not like we're going to totally give up on like creating aggregated assets for our web pages, but it will mean that we have more flexibility there. And you know, if you need to deliver a few assets, you don't have to like sweat getting it down to one thing as much as maybe you might otherwise do. Also, we can do away with domain sharding, which um, actually will perform worse under HTTP/2 than it would in the old world, and it's also just kind of messy and, and, and you know kind of trashy. It's like very old school web. Nobody wants to do that anymore. Uh, HTTP2 also introduces the capability at the protocol level of pushing to the client. Um, this is uh, uh, basically the, the, the theory here is when I request the web page, um, the origin or the server, in addition to delivering the HTML of the web page, can know that the HTML also requires these set of assets and can begin sending those immediately without waiting for the client to parse the result and request the associated assets. Um, there are ways to do this now um, with, uh, 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 if you have a web server that supports it, there's like probably a, there's a mod for uh, Apache and Nginx. And basically you just set some headers um, in your response from Drupal. Uh, they'll be picked up by the web server and if it's doing HTTP2 with the client, we'll start that push. Um, I believe Cloudflare, which is one of those free CDNs that I mentioned, just added this uh, across, uh, you can turn this on for your site as well. So if you, again, if you set a link header, um, it's not in the head of the document, it's actually an HTTP header. Um, you set that link header, Cloudflare will see that, and when clients connect to it, it'll just start the push right away. Um, and it's a fun thing to play around with. Um, there's going to be a huge amount of potential here in terms of what we're able to do uh, to deliver more of these kind of sub 100 millisecond kind of active experiences. One of the ways you can get under 100 milliseconds is like getting a browser to prefetch the content that you think the user is going to want to see. So like you can you can do this now actually if if you're clever. Like if you have um, a funnel on a website that's like five steps. And you actually don't need to know all of what they put into step one to render step two. There, you can just do a, a, a link prefetch and actually get the browser itself to request the second page before the user clicks the button. And then when they click the button, they'll have that sub 100 millisecond real time interaction, pupils dilating, dopamine pinging kind of experience that we're all really going for. Um, this, is, this is still uh, fairly experimental, or not, not the, the, at the protocol level, it's no longer experimental, it's there. The applications to this are somewhat experimental because in a perfect world, you'd actually want Drupal to be able to actively push to the client, which is not quite possible yet since the, you're not talking directly to PHP yet, uh, but maybe in the future we could actually do that. Uh, and now Big Pipe. Um, Big Pipe, uh, did everybody, anybody, anybody, who here saw Fabian and Vim's Presentation. Okay, so it's, I'm, I apologize. This will be uh, uh, a remedial for those of you, but I, I'm very, I'm unreasonably excited about this for Drupal 8, um, and I think it's important to get the word out. So, when I talk about Big Pipe, I'm actually talking about, um, I'm actually talking about a whole uh, lot of things. Some of which are actually just what what we did in Drupal 8 with um, uh, getting cache metadata together and allowing for rendering and isolation. So, in the era of Drupal 7. Um, we had this challenge which was 
uh, the path by which any content would be rendered and then ultimately delivered to the user was indeterminate because anything could alter anything at any time. There are these giant render arrays being passed around and you, uh, as the, at the Drupal system architecture level, it was explicitly like, I don't know, you figure it out, figure out what you want to do. And that's why uh, plugins, uh, or sorry, co contrib modules like um, Authcache are kind of so complicated and requires a very site specific implementation to really deliver the value because Drupal itself as a system is not able to know deterministically what the rendering path will be for any particular thing. That has changed in Drupal 8 as of the advent of Drupal 8. It's one of the great advances we got out of kind of the, the, uh, the big platform rebuild. And Big Pipe is a very like tangible dopamine inducing example of what is possible want now that we have that underlying foundation. Um, and the great thing about Big Pipe is because it's built on this underlying foundation that all other things are is it's a general purpose performance improvement. Um, you will still not need to break it with your website, but most websites building on Drupal 8 will be able to take advantage of this without needing to do anything special other than like what they would normally do with blocks and so forth. So if you haven't seen the demo, uh, Vim has a demo site up there at bigpipe.demo.vimleers.com, and it does that progressive rendering thing that I showed before in Drupal. So the, uh, you, you create, you start a session, uh, because Big Pipe is about delivering dynamic content, so like if, you, if it's totally cached page, just like get it in a CDN or get it in a reverse proxy, and that's as good as you're gonna get. But for dynamic pages, you can deliver the, the non-dynamic part of the web page immediately, and that can render for the user and make them happy, and then the parts of the page that are dynamic and take more time to generate can be inserted later. And this is actually something, you know, again, you don't need to write custom code to do this. It works with Drupal's block system out of the box. This is the type of technology that, you know, companies like Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter invest like hundreds of engineer years in building up and like tons of infrastructure around. And we're actually gonna get it out of the box um, for all the sites we build with Drupal 8. There's like, if this is the kind of stuff that excites you, there's no better reason to take Drupal 8 really seriously starting now, uh, in my opinion. This is a, a total game changer. And how it works is kind of similar to um, the HTTP2 story a little bit. Actually, Big Pipe has an idea. Um, the moniker came out of Facebook, and we should all just be like, so glad that Vim did that internship there because <laughs> he brought back a lot of good ideas. Um, Classically, in HTTP, you send a response from the client to the server, your browser, and Drupal. Drupal must build the entire page before it can respond. Right? Drupal needs to figure everything out before, because again, in Drupal 7, anything could alter anything. So until we're completely done building that page and it's all ready to be flushed out of the output buffer, we just don't know. So we have to hold on to it until we're all done. And then we can send it down the wire, which means the slowest thing on your page, like the, the whatever little thing on a block over here or a little personalization thing in the header or whatever, that will hold up the whole show. With Drupal 8, because we have uh, same cache metadata and we can render things in isolation, it's actually possible to deliver a whole lot of the page really quickly um, and then send down the other bits that, uh, to, to the browser that um, took more time to render when they're ready. And this just requires you to have like a no buffer, uh, you have to have non-buffering um, between your origin and your, your client, but like M Apache does this out of the box. So like actually this will work pretty much just like that for the simple use case of like, oh yeah, I, I set up a thing on DigitalOcean, just installed the generic LAMP stack, just installed generic Drupal 8.1, big pipe works. Like that's incredibly powerful. Like you can go a long ways with this if you have a super advanced use case, but this is a, it's really inspiring from their talk. The idea that this is something we're delivering that is super valuable for both the enterprise and the hobbyist level. And that is to me the true promise of Drupal 8 that we'll be able to deliver these types of experiences that you know, Fortune 500 companies salivate over and will spend, like would normally spend enormous amounts of time and energy on, but it's also good for just someone like me who runs a personal blog. Um, and we'll have to see in the future what, you know, what the, the next steps are with Drupal and HTTP2 and what we can build on top again of this foundation of stronger caching metadata and isolated rendering. Um, kind of like to the, I stole this slide, I've stolen this slide for so many presentations. This is like Drupal 7, right? We're, Drupal's made of Legos. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's cool because you can take the Legos and put them together however you want. And if you just had like the big messy bucket of Legos that you end up with and you decided to build a cruise ship with whatever Legos you had available, you would end up with something like this. Right? It's like kind of ugly, doesn't really have much coherence to it, but it is a ship. 
Uh, so it has that going for it. And in Drupal 8, we've kind of moved into this world where we still have Legos, we're still highly adjustable, but there's much stronger architecture around how we're putting these Legos together, which types of Legos go where, get the colors to match up, and, uh, and this is kind of like kind of more a pleasing and aesthetic to look at. And if you were trying to extend your ship and think about a cool little feature, it'd be more fun to build like a cool prow on, on this with a few extra Legos than like deal with this thing. Um, so Drupal 8, very excited about it for all these reasons. Um, I kind of often have this metaphor of like Drupal 7 and, and the web in general. One of the challenges um, for the open web, which is like something I think about a lot, is it's a jungle out there, man. Um, there's like so many decisions to make and so few clear guidelines on how to make them. Um, one of the things that is astonishing to me um, when I was doing research uh, for this blog post is uh, do you know who the actual market leader for all open web stuff is? It's GoDaddy. GoDaddy is the market leader for open web things. And it, it's like, it fits, right? Because the, the GoDaddy experience is just like this of like, like what are you supposed to do? I don't know, I clicked a bunch of stuff and now I have a website somehow. <laughs> and they've, they've made that work for them, which I, it's an achievement. Um, <laughs> But the GoDaddy model is not going to scale. Um, it's, it's not a pleasant model to work with, and I don't think it, it gives us what we need for the future of the open web, which is, you know, we have billions more people coming online. This has to get better. We have to get better at doing this and stop wasting so much time with BS and focus on more important problems. And so I think Drupal 7 was a little bit like this, with the, the fact that everything was so indeterminate and anything could be rendered anywhere, and like, lots, like no, no, I never put a template in a, in a, I never put a query in a template, uh, right? All these things, it was kind of messy and you weren't sure where things were supposed to go. There's five ways to do anything, and one of them's probably wrong, and two of them might be right, but I heard this one guy say at the talk that we should do it differently. So, uh, Right? It's hard. And, and like, the good news is a lot of us found our way through this jungle, a lot of us found success, and millions of websites were built with Drupal 7. But I believe Drupal 8 will actually give us much more to go on. There will be infrastructure in place. There will be correct ways to do things. We will actually be able to do much more of Drupal development in Drupal 8 kind of by the book, which is actually great because it allows us to focus more on what we're trying to do at the end of the road than like what's the meandering path we have to cut through the jungle. And so initially, the learning curve can be actually kind of painful because what you might find is that the path that you liked to take in Drupal 7, like you, maybe you hewed it out with a machete or like you were just following Morton wherever he was going. Um, <laughs> blazes the trail, that guy. Uh, you might find that that old path in Drupal 7, in Drupal 8, like it just runs straight into the wall, right? Because it's not on the happy path. Um, or it's not possible. Or you can do it, but it feels super convoluted because you're like driving on the, you know, in the median. Um, but I think we, as we learn Drupal 8 and as we develop, we can do, develop much stronger community best practices around site building that will lead to much more performant and delightful experiences for our users. And ultimately, that's what we're here to do. And that's like one of the reasons I'm so excited about Drupal 8. I think there's a ton of value there. Um, Real talk, none of this is free. This talk has cost $10,000. You'll have to go, go and invest more of your time and energy if you want to do this, um, if you want to make this work. You may have to justify the time and energy it takes to get these sorts of things done. Um, and I want to help you do that and give you um, arguments. Hopefully there have been arguments in here that you can recycle and regurgitate to other people who maybe like look at your timesheets or determine how long you're allowed to work on something so that you can actually put in the necessary effort to learn and execute on this stuff. Um, but here's the checklist. It's like the six things you've got to do to get front-end performance. Um, actually, it's just what the, an agile process looks like, right? You should set some goals. You should analyze your rendering waterfall. You should do mobile performance testing early and often. Um, you should inventory and cost the elements of your page. And then you can have a rational discussion with your stakeholders of, is this element on the page worth the time that we're making people wait for it? And like, that could lead to some very interesting discussions. You might find low-hanging fruit. Um, you, know, you might also find that you need to declare performance bankruptcy. Right? That might be a, a hard truth to come to realize. But my guess is that along the way to like doing your accounting and realizing you're bankrupt, you'll find some incremental improvements that aren't that difficult to make, and that will be a rewarding experience. You can target the next stable state, measure the change after release, lather, rinse, repeat. You could be, like agile development is the only way really to improve front-end performance in this way. Um, so I don't know anything, I just 
repeat what other smart people say. And this is all just like a, a way to paraphrase Mark and like so many others that have said, this is how do you do performance? You get good data and then you analyze it. And that's why like those of you who want to get into performance, this is all it takes. Get good data and analyze it. You can learn how to do this. It's not black magic. It's not even rocket science or brain surgery. It's just getting data, analyzing it, making changes, measuring those changes, doing that over and over and over again. And it's super important uh, for the community and for the web in general that we do this. So I'd like to close. Uh, I like things, things sound more revolutionary when, they say, when I, you say them in Spanish. So I'm going to try this. Somos todos desarredores de aplicaciones para usuario. We are all front-end developers, whether we like it or not. So let's work on making this better. Um, I'm happy to take questions if you guys have them at the mics. Otherwise, we can just hang out and chat later. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to DrupalCon. Thank you for making Drupal great. And thank you for spending $10,000 listening to me. Oh, yeah, and, and vote, vote me up on the website so I get to do this again. Oh yeah, go, go for it. Um, I'll repeat the questions for the recording. Yeah, so, so the question is, do, is it worthwhile to invest time in CSS uh, rendering, time to paint, and so forth, uh, or should you just focus on the server response time? And sort of like, um, here, let me, well, I'm going to plug my thing back in so I can load the slide. That's the best answer to that question. Um, so this slide is my best whack at giving a canonical answer, which is, if you are in a position where your server response time is poor, that should be your focus because that should be easy to solve, right? The, the, the making the server fast, making Drupal fast on the server is like not necessarily, like it's not easy to solve, but that is something where there are a decade plus of best practices. You can buy this in many cases from different providers in different ways. Like that should be something where if that's where you're stuck, just focus on getting out of being stuck there, and you should be able to achieve that relatively quickly. Um, and then you need to move up and focus on the next few things. So, so uh, if you're in a position where your server response time is slow, fix that first. You should be able to fix that. Um, there's enough stuff out there that we make. We, hopefully, no one is still, no one is, uh, I, people do still struggle with this. But we don't, it, it's like kind of a solved problem. So like just get, a, get one of the solutions, and then, Spend a lot of time, like solve this fast so you have time to focus on the things that are further up the stack because there aren't necessarily easy wins or easy solutions for how to make the, the browser render fast or other experiences. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Okay, cool. By explain, yeah. Right. Um, so what you need, so it, it's hard because, um, oh yeah, repeat the question, thank you. Uh, the question is, how do you convince clients that this is important? Because they want 50 fonts and 1,000 images, and you, know, you guys just figure it out. Um, so it's, it's difficult, um, uh, because depending on the level of the sophistication of the client, like making a technical argument to them is not going to be very persuasive. So uh, what I would recommend is, um, making an argument to them based on business value. Um, as developers, I think it's important that we can all speak the language of business value, whether that's with clients or with our colleagues or with stakeholders inside of our organizations. Um, because if we can't justify the work that we do in terms of the effect that it will have in the real world, then we're, you know, it, not, it's not even just about justification, it's about doing the right work. So 
the, the, what I would recommend in general is to talk, like make the clients aware of the user experience research that suggests that if they don't deliver a performant experience, people will bl browse away or not wait for their website and explain that like, they're, like there's just trade-offs here. Like if you want all this stuff, it's gonna be slow. Your users are gonna be frustrated. And if your clients are of the like, maybe, um, I find like a, a lowest common denominator argument you can make is like Google will rank you down if this is slow. Like do you want that? Do you want Google to rank you down? Because if so, let's just throw all the fonts on there. If you want a top search result, if you care about your SEO, which most clients should, then we need to think about how to make this fast. And that's at least a way to get people away from where they're demanding stuff that would put you in like the 10 second render kind of area. Um, it may, it may, you may have to make like a higher value argument to get them to like give you budget and time to go for like under one second. But if you're in sort of struggling with like really unreasonable requests or like, you know, we need five more ad units here. It's like, ah, oh, it, it's never gonna work out if we do that. We're gonna be racing to the bottom. So I would say just try to make it so that they understand that the, rent, the user experience uh, performance is critical to whether their website succeeds in its mission. And um, also show it to them on a slow mobile connection with less data. Because if you see it, how someone would experience it in that way, um, that convinces much faster than if you're just testing the site locally with the fast connection, they never understand. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. So you can kind of do what I did in the presentation, where you're like, okay, let's just see what this would be. And just like, it's, I mean, does this seem good to you? Is that, is that is this what we want to do? And if they'll say, no, you have to make it faster. You're like, well, okay. In order to do that, I need to talk to you about whether, what, which of these fonts we can cut, because that's just how this works. And, you know, some people are unreasonable, but you do the best you can. Yes? Is there an HTTP2 is ready to be implemented now? Yep. So HTTP2 is uh, ready to be implemented now. That is correct. So uh, all of the browsers, the major browsers, now support it. Um, and you increasingly can get uh, support for it from the major web servers like Nginx and Apache uh, fairly easily through configuration or an easy mod. Um, uh, Cloudflare, which is a free CDN, which I recommend checking out if, if you've not used a CDN before. They make it pretty easy and they offer a pretty good service. They will do HTTP2 for you. And there's some pretty, um, what we need really right now, I think honestly, and I, I should do this myself, um, is more tutorials on like how to set this up and then how to measure that it's working. It's actually a little bit difficult to get a good HTTP2 like testing and debugging setup going right now. Or it's not difficult once you have it set up, but there's not a good like how to guide on that. But it's ready today. All the technology is in place. We don't need to wait for like some provider to do something or somebody to roll something out. It's all there. It's actually, it's now on us to like start implementing it and getting really good at it and socializing best practices around it. Ooh, good question. Uh, the question was, when will HTTP2 be available on Pantheon? I'm hoping before the end of the year. Yeah. Um, so I found, I've done the analysis of the waterfall, and I found that where it rips into the river is third-party ads. Yep. So what happens when you're looking at your waterfall and you realize that the big problem is third party ads. Uh, so ads are particularly uh, worrisome in this regard, but this is true of any third party asset. Um, what I would say is if you have uh, third party assets in your uh, DOM must be asynchronously loaded unless you have a really good reason not to. Because what happens if you put a third party asset in your DOM and it's not marked for asynchronous loading, you have now given license to that third party to take your website offline, basically. That's what it amounts to. You've said, eh, I'm just, I'm just gonna like tie my uptime to their uptime. And because uh, if my users are trying to see my web page and it, the browser has to wait to time out on their thing, that could take 30, 60, even 90 seconds. So basically, if you have a third party thing that needs to load for your website, which there are legitimate reasons to do, advertising is one that is hard to escape. They have to, like, you have to win the battle to make them asynchronously loaded. And, and ads are an especially good one. Even TechCrunch was doing that, by the way. I don't know if you, you noticed, like, the super slow uh, page load. The ad at the top didn't pop in until the very end. Um, it's actually their, their, like, their page load is just too fat. Um, but yeah, asynchronousness is the only answer to that. Um, 
it, it, uh, so thanks. Because so the question is, would BigPipe help with that? Could you put the third-party ad in a block and have it load later? That might help, except that usually if you're doing ad-driven websites, BigPipe is, uh, you're going to be caching full pages anyway. And so BigPipe wouldn't have that much of an impact, uh, would, wouldn't be in play in the first place. You would still want the content that is in that block to make sure that the browser understood that the third-party asset can be loaded asynchronously, that it's a non-blocking asset. So that it, if, even if it takes however long, it's going to continue processing the rest of the, uh, the document. Well, there's a, another possibility you could do, kind of today, with these types of code, but you could kind of ensure that the actual script code, you're putting that into a behavior instead or into some JavaScript setting. And then you have some code that just runs and the document is ready, and you're putting another set timer on it so that it really runs last, and just then it catches kind of the data. So you could use kind of the same approach we're using in Google like everywhere and with big type, etc. To just set a placeholder for yourself and attach that placeholder to JavaScript settings, write a behavior, and attach your ad. So that's in my opinion how ads should always be. And it, um, then, I, then it would still be great if it's as internal, but then it's not as important anymore. Yeah, that's a good, so the idea of uh, using custom code, uh, but not very complicated custom code, to deliver uh, inline, deliver placeholders for your ad units that, ha that also like have the right size and so forth, so the layout doesn't jump around, but then using Drupal behaviors, JavaScript behaviors, to say, once everything else is done, go ahead and start replacing those placeholders by fetching from the third party. And that would ensure a valid user experience. That could be a whole session in and of itself. Um, yes? Uh, so your ads can be loaded in an iframe. So that's what you want to have, right? So it's totally applicable to the right and application. Yeah. Yeah, so the, another strategy, and then it's kind of that, that's a classic strategy for doing this, is just iframing your ads so that they're, um, they, they're guaranteed to load asynchronously and they can do whatever they want and they're in their own sandbox. That's another, another really good point. Any more for any more? All right, thank you so much. which could be from, its own, from the edge cache as well. No, no, no. That would be booting up Drupal and sending all those things. And even if the content had changed, it ah. would even update the content right dynamically. Cool. And like that. So there's uh, some new stuff coming down the pipeline. That would be great. That would be actually, from what we were talking about earlier, that might be a thing for us to work on this summer. Thanks for sitting up front. I think the, pro the point is to be like bad, but not so bad that it's cringeworthy. It's like you want to be like funny, right? Which means that you can't be terrible, but you can't, like you know, it's also supposed to be a little embarrassing. That's a feature. Ugh. Oh. All right. Now I'm done.
Do you have any relationship with the Varnish people at all? No, not with Varnish Project directly, although we're building a pretty good relationship with Fastly. Okay. So. Yeah, I think that the that's problem is the pitch getting the, 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 the